Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Welcome to the second episode of uh, the Hamahang Bachi podcast. Uh, we have with us today Dr. Ali Raza, who is the Associate Professor of History at LUMS. He is also the Director of the Continuing Education Studies. And he has uh, more relevantly and recently written uh, his new book, which is Revolutionary Pasts, uh, Communist Internationalism in Colonial India. And uh, without actually elaborating on what this book is about, uh, I would leave that to the discussion and to the podcast. And I think as per tradition, I'm going to give the opening uh, question uh, and the conversation to Noor. Okay, so um, just to begin the conversation, um, we asked you to ask what is this book about and why did you decide to write it and also your experience of writing it. I mean, it, it reads like a narrative and there are lots of stories threaded together. So why did you decide to write a book in that way? And also what writers influenced your method of writing and, and just if you could uh, give us a sense of that. Absolutely. Uh, that's a huge opening question and a great one too. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you uh, most of all for having me. Uh, it's a real privilege. Uh, it's a real privilege of speaking to you both. Um, so my book, um, broadly speaking, is a book on decolonization and communist internationalism in South Asia. And I guess that if I were to describe uh, the genesis of this book, uh, perhaps I could begin from the question of betrayal, and more specifically, the betrayal that came with freedom. And what I mean by that is not that freedom itself was a betrayal. What I mean by that specifically is that uh, the kind of freedom that we inherited in South Asia, and I suppose one can invoke uh, the global South generally um, in that frame, is that that freedom was very far away and very removed uh, from the many expectations and desires and aspirations uh, that people associated um, with freedom uh, and what it meant and what it ought to have been. Um, and if I were to give a much more elaborate uh, background to that, so I would explain it in this way that the political formations and the divided cartographies that we inherited in South Asia um, in some ways, they seem predestined, uh, they seem enduring. Um, and by that definition, they also seem durable. Um, and what that misses out on is are the many other political options or ideas of decolonization that uh, existed at the time in the lead up to independence. Uh, those are options that seem either marginal or they seem non-existent in our day, in our time. And that is certainly what uh, nationalist historiography would have us uh, believe. And yet, um, I'm interested in exploring uh, the truly vast range of dreams and expectations that were associated uh, with, in the, uh, with independence. Uh, and that is where uh, communism and the left, by and large, uh, becomes important uh, for my investigation. Um, and by way of a wider introduction to the left and communism, I would say that um, it's part of a panoply. It is part of a truly diverse range uh, again, of dreams and expectations that were associated with uh, independence. And so uh, it becomes one of many expressions. Um, but in that time, it is certainly uh, one of the most greatest and the grandest projects uh, of the first half of the 20th century. Um, and I mean, uh, and, and, and when I say that, I have, uh, I have the entire globe in mind in some ways. Um, this is, without doubt, uh, one of the grandest political experiments. Um, it's one of the greatest stories of the 20th century. And my book traces the inflections uh, and, uh, of that story, of that, of that project uh, in South Asia. And so my book traces, ends up tracing and documenting uh, revolutionary lives, revolutionary desires, and revolutionary dreams uh, in South Asia from, uh, let's say, the turn of the 20th century to the period just after uh, independence. Um, so that's the book. Um, 
and, and, and perhaps I could elaborate more on, on, on why this period is so uh, formative and so interesting for me. Uh, but to go to the second part of your question uh, before that, which is uh, my experience of writing it, um, there were choices to be made. Uh, and this was a very difficult choice for me. Um, and the choice was, uh, in some ways, thinking about what kind of a mode of writing would be faithful to the story that I was trying to tell. Um, the very simplest motivation was to write in a way, in a way, in a mode of writing that would appeal to audiences that were not necessarily academic. Um, but beyond that, I suppose um, the attempt was to write um, narratively in a way that would, as I said, be faithful to the euphoria of the times. And the, the period that I chart, that I attempt to chart, um, is a period that is marked by um, as, as another historian would have put it, he's, he's commenting on some other like, moment in the 20th century, but he calls them the vertigo years. Uh, and so I think that phrase, the vertigo years, also captures uh, this, this, this period, the interwar period, when there are all sorts of ideas, all sorts of movements, uh, all sorts of expectations uh, that are driving people in the struggle for national liberation. Um, and so my attempt was to write a narrative in a way that would hopefully be faithful uh, to that euphoric, uh, to those euphoric times. Um, and, uh, and that's why I chose to write it like a story of sorts. In some ways, I sometimes feel that perhaps this is a story that is better suited for fiction writers. Um, I'm certainly not a fiction writer. Um, I don't have any training as a fiction writer. Um, and in fact, it's a, uh, one of the characters of my book has been rendered into a fictional character as well uh, in, 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 in an Urdu novel. Uh, but, uh, but, but I suppose that might have been the most appropriate way of describing the story. But, uh, but, but beyond that, I think that um, this was, I suppose, uh, my, uh, my, my, my logic in writing the way that I chose to write it. I, I don't know whether I succeeded or not, but that was certainly the attempt. Um, and the second point that I would say is that it also reads it also weaves in um, perhaps stories that may seem disconnected. There is no one linear story that traces uh, a life from inception to, 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 to its end. Um, and this is me trying to be faithful to the way that these, uh, to the way that these lives also come across in archives, uh, in the archives, but they exist as uh, fragments. And so part of my uh, project and part of the difficulty of this project was in trying to trace together and trying to piece together uh, lives that exist either as fragments and which almost most certainly exist as 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 seditious as as lives that 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 were basically traitorous, at least in the colonial rendering of things. Um, and so my and, and so the fragmentary nature, perhaps, of this narrative. Um, was also a bit deliberate on my end. And that was me being trying to be faithful to the way that these lives come across um, in the accounts that I read. Um, and yet there is an attempt of trying to tell a larger story um, from that tells uh, a, a larger account of how um, communism as a political expression, as a political project, um, with all of its twists and turns, uh, evolved over the course of the interwar years um, and down to uh, decolonization and uh, independence. Um, so that uh, you know was a brief, uh, in some ways, account of of why I chose to write uh, the way I did, uh, and where this book uh, comes from. Um, there was another part of your question that I'm maybe forgetting. I'm sorry about that. Um, I think was it about the books? No, it was uh, just about um, what writers kind of feed into your writing because. I mean, I'm sure that um, when, as a writer, you try to emulate other writers and, and I mean, the yeah. books you read kind of seep into, probably have seeped into your book as well. So just wanted to know what those authors were for you and who you turned to when you were struggling to write or. That's a great question. I mean, I, I, suppose, the, I suppose the deaths are truly um, enormous um, and a lot of books and a lot of writers fed into uh, perhaps subconsciously as, uh, as well, uh, crept into the writing of this book in a way that may not even be acknowledged explicitly by me, or in a way that perhaps I wasn't fully cognizant of. Um, 
But certainly, if I were to if I were to think of one book that really uh, informed uh, the way that I could tell the story, uh, is a book that recently uh, came out of my recent. I mean, it hasn't been more than seven eight years. Uh, it's a fantastic book which traces uh, uh, the Bengali diaspora community, uh, especially in the United States. It's a book called Bengali Harlan. It's by Vivek Ball. Um, it's a book that was published by Harvard University Press. Uh, there are other books too, uh, Maya Ramnath, um, other books of late that came, out, that came out in the past decade that trace the history of transnationalism and cosmopolitanism in South Asia. Um, and uh, in some ways, all of those fed in that I write. A lot of the books and, and, and writers uh, whose ideas I'm indebted to, and I guess that I can, I can, I can invoke them as, as we go along this interview. I suspect they will come up. Uh, as we as we proceed, as we proceed. Yeah, um, and and I think we will uh, get to there in, in sort of the, like the latter part of this conversation. Uh, you you mention and and this book in itself stands uh, as a testimony to the fact that it it contextualizes the period as a period of hopes, dreams, expectations, and I'd actually like to uh, quote to. Uh, citations that you have uh, to people who, that you have cited um, and I'd like, like to read a bit and then uh, I think I can move on to uh, my questions of, of what, what this utopia really signifies. Um, so, so the first uh, person that you, you quote uh, that really stands out is Ernst Bloch in the spirit of utopia and I, I'd actually I'd like to read a bit. Um, he writes, only in us does this light still burn, and we are beginning a fantastic journey toward it. A journey toward the interpretation of our waking dream, toward the implementation of the central concept of utopia. To find it, to find the right thing for which it is worthy to live, to be organized, and to have time. That is why we go, why we cut new, metaphysically constitutive parts. Summon what is not, build into the blue, and build ourselves into the blue. And there, seek the true, the real, where the merely factual disappears. And the second part, uh, you quote, this is a relatively shorter uh, sentence by Reinhard, Reinhard Kaselek, where she points out how historians have become more attuned to privileging histories of experience over histories of expectations. Um, and I think the question is a rather deceivingly simple one, which is uh, what do these histories of expectations tell us why are they so necessary why can't we simply quote experiences call that history and um, do away with it and call ourselves historians why do we have to have our work cut out for us when we try to understand what these histories of expectations are primarily because they don't stand as tangible objects uh, as tangible stories it is a dream after all so why why are they important and how does a historian grasp, in fact, what they are in the first place? That's an incredible question. Thank you for it. Um, I guess as historians, we, uh, we start from the vantage point of knowing what happened. And so this is what I meant when I began with uh, the point about that in hindsight, right, at least it seems that the political cartographies and the formations that we inherit seem predestined. Um, and so every other dream that was, so, that was associated with perhaps a different outcome um, seems, again, uh, as if it was misplaced. Um, and as historians, um, as Kozelek reminds us, and his is a book that I'm deeply indebted to. Uh, the book is called Future's Past. It transformed the way that I think about history. Kozelek is, 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 is one of the most prominent philosophers of history. Um, uh, as, as, as Kozelek reminds us, that as historians, we are perhaps more attuned to documenting a history of experiences, which he calls the space of experience. Uh, we're fairly good at that. Um, but where perhaps we miss a trick or two is where we perhaps inadequately fail to imagine what that future horizon may have looked like to the subjects we seek to study. A horizon that may have informed the way they acted and a horizon the way that, that may have animated their time, their moment, with all kinds of possibilities that seemed all too real in their moment, uh, but which seemed very um, distant in our moment. And so uh, a part of the struggle always is to, to 
to somehow to capture that horizon of ex that, that that horizon of expectation that as as Kozele calls uh, calls it that inform the actions of the of the subjects whose stories we seek to tell. Um, and by way of a larger uh, and, and 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 I'm glad that you also quoted Bloch because um, I, I suppose when it comes to utopias and utopian thinking, I suppose the first um, disclaimer that I would like to make is that um, utopias or more specifically utopian thinking is not really a wishful fantasy. It's not really a flight of fancy. It's not really a mere desire to escape from reality as it is commonly portrayed. Um, hardly any, I mean, anything but in fact. Um, I think that what I try to take seriously is that dreamscapes and utopian thinking are very real, and they were very, very real for at least the subjects that I chose to tell the story of. And, 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 and it, again, I would like to return to the moment that we inhabit, which is a moment that is marked by a deep suspicion of utopian projects. Um, um, I was a child who grew up in the 80s, um, and the 90s, by and large, were marked uh, by, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were marked by a deep suspicion of all kinds of grand narratives, of all kinds of utopian projects. Uh, and there was plenty of, obviously, evidence to justify that. Uh, I mean, one had the evidence of, for example, uh, totalitarian dictatorships, uh, communist totalitarian dictatorships everywhere from Cambodia uh, to North Korea, um, other contexts as well. There was obviously the example, the terrible legacy of Stalinism. Uh, so uh, that deep suspicion of utopian projects morphed uh, into and easily slipped into a deep suspicion of utopian thinking as well. Uh, and I want to make a, make a distinction between the two, between utopian projects and utopian thinking. And by utopian thinking, what I take seriously um, is this urge, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a way of thought, is a pattern of thought that takes reality seriously, that, that closely engages with reality, that critically engages with reality uh, as it surrounds us. Uh, but it's a way of thinking that is animated, that is oriented towards transforming that reality and overcoming that reality. Um, and I take that seriously. And and the reason why it seems very distant from us is precisely because uh, in this day and age, in our moment, perhaps um, the only utopian thinking that is being invoked, as I, as I see it, uh, in our moment is a, is a utopian thinking of the far right. The left, by and large, it seems to me, has lost um, that, that mode of utopian thinking. It's, uh, it, it's, it is, in some ways, our moment can be thought of also as a crisis of imagination. Uh, it's something that, us, uh, that other scholars have noted as well. And so uh, to return to that moment, it seems all too distant from us, but um, to see that moment from the eyes of those who inhabited it, of those who inhabited it, that, that idea of transformation, that idea of, 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 of overturning the world as, 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 as they knew it was all too tangible, was all too plausible. Uh, we can come to why that was the case in a bit, but to return to um, this question of utopian thinking generally, um, one can also think of it. Uh, one, one can also think of it as a way of thinking that seeks to, perhaps, rend, uh, perhaps unnaturalize what seems to be natural, what 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 seems to be real, and it's a way of thinking that perhaps seeks to naturalize what is said to be the unnatural. So what is said to be the impossible, what is said to be the impractical, what is said to be uh, the implausible. Uh, utopian thinking seeks to naturalize that, and so um, that. It's a key part of, 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 of the horizon uh, of the political subjects uh, that I chose to study. Um, and, to, and, to, uh, and to expand upon that, um, again, to return to that moment in, in the interwar years in the lead up to independence in South Asia and the global south, even after that, because decolonization of the process extends very quickly. Um, and it's truly remarkable um, to see um, how these subjects are imagining the possibilities and, 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 and the promise that, that, that independence kind of like holds out for them. So to invoke our end and to make this more specific, you're somehow caught between uh, the no longer and the not yet. And what I mean by that is that by the 1920s and 1930s, it's increasingly evident in South Asia um, that 
empire is not an enduring phenomenon. It's not there to stay. And yet, you are not there. Uh, at least you're not at the destination that you would like to be. Um, and so that stage, uh, that in-betweenness uh, between the no longer and the not yet uh, is a time of immense possibility, uh, a time where the imagination runs wild, a time uh, that is characterized by an imagination that is fueled by conviction and a near certainty uh, in the forces of history, um, that, uh, that the forces that we deliver uh, the awaited hour, that tryst with destiny, as Jawaharlal Nehru uh, called it. Uh, and so um, that, uh, in some ways, you know, was my attempt, that, you know, to capture that horizon uh, that these individuals imagined themselves uh, being in. And the other reason why I think that I chose to take the framework of utopian thinking seriously is that I was thinking of ways to understand these subjects, and that taking to the archive, because part of the challenge that faces us as, as historians um, especially in our moment, historians of South Asia, is that uh, we are, more often than not, we are responding to the colonial archive. We are responding to the colonial archive. We are speaking back to it. Um, and so these figures who I chart and document and trace lives of in my book, they emerge as obviously seditious, they emerge, but they also emerge as fanatical uh, men and women who are driven by impossible dreams. And so it's all too easy, uh, especially in our moment when that idea of utopian thinking seems remote. It's all too easy to be to echo that very same uh, tenor and tone and characterization of these figures. Um, and so this is where Bloch and the framework of utopian thinking uh, becomes important because utopia and utopian thinking as a framework. Um, allows me to rethink these figures who would otherwise only appear as fanatics or simpletons who are easily misled. Um, and so the examples that are the concrete example that I can give is that I mean there are all kinds of characters in this time and period who set up what seem to be impossible projects. People, for example, who set up military training schools for Indian uh, migrants in Argentina with the hope of uh, going to Moscow and eventually overthrowing the empire in British India. Uh, it seems like an impossible project. Um, but at the time, and that's my point, at the time, it seemed all too real. And in the case of communists, obviously, uh, there was also this belief of sorts. There was also this conviction that there are forces of history that would eventually lead us to some kind of a victorious outcome. And so that action that may otherwise seem all too implausible, all too incredible, all too fantastical, actually makes a lot of sense. And so this is why um, I take seriously uh, Kozelik's invocation of how we as historians uh, should also be more attuned to charting the horizon of expectation uh, through which we can seek to understand uh, the subjects of our histories uh, in a better way. Um, I can go on, but I think I'll stop here. Um, uh, there's much more to say on that, obviously, but yeah. Yeah, so since we're talking about these individuals and um, I mean, one of the distinctions that you made in your book is that these dreams are different from the ideologies of Marxism and, and all these uh, big concepts, right? So do you think that sometimes these, or have these ideologies in some ways um, made these dreams smaller in some way? Have these dreams become less brave? Have they become less wider or, or adventurous, I guess? What is your take on that? That's a wonderful question. I suppose that one can um, start off from perhaps uh, the normative and the conventional view that we have of uh, Marxism and specifically of the, of the kind of project that was advanced by the Soviet Union, especially uh, in its Stalinist uh, you know, avatar and what followed after it. Uh, because what is striking to me uh, are the many meanings and the multiple multiplicity of meaning, actually, that were associated with uh, both the question of Marxism and communism uh, in the 1910s, in the 1920s, and so on. And so those ideas of what that meant were always in excess of what we think Marxism is as a, as a fixed ideology. It never really was, historically speaking. It was, it was always, in some ways, um, you know, uh, it evolved, obviously, 
It undermined many changes. It has multiple meanings uh, for people around the world. Uh, but the the but, but the kind of aspirations and dreams that I try to chart, and the ideas that I try to document, uh, seem in excess of what we understand conventionally uh, by uh, a mark. And so um, that uh, is the first response uh, to your question. Uh, the other is that um, I think that that question of grand uh, narrative, um, I think, um, is also very important because uh, I think the implication behind your question is well, whether this, uh, with this with, whether that uh, whether this obsession with ideology uh, may have reduced the meaning and the expanse of these of these ideas and aspirations and dreams. Um, the answer is both. Um, yes and no, and it's also tied to particular moments. So it's certainly true that uh, communism, as it is expressed in the late 1930s and 1940s, and afterwards as well, uh, seems perhaps a more reduced version of what it meant in the early 1920s, before that as well. Um, and so that's one way to look at it. Um, the other way to look at it is also that, um, again, to quote and to invoke um, Hannah Arendt, is that uh, perhaps grand uh, narratives um, also come with certain perils. And Arendt obviously is thinking of the history of, of totalitarianism. And she's all too conscious of how, the, uh, of how political possibilities were eroded and how a certain complacency was put into place by this obsession and by this belief in the grand narrative of history and the grand narrative of that, that, that a fixed ideology offers uh, you know, people. Um, so all that granted, but I think that there is also a certain seductive power of grand narratives. There is also a seductive power of ideology. Um, take the case of communism, for instance, uh, in South Asia. I mean, as a contrast, think of it this way. Um, this is a political project in the 1920s that is offering colonial subjects a seat at the table. The Soviet Union may be the first amongst equals, but it is still offers that opportunity for colonial subjects across the world, not just South Asia, and I cannot emphasize this enough, this is a truly global project in that sense. It offers colonial, uh, it offers colonial subjects a seat at the table where questions of national liberation, where questions of revolution, where questions of decolonization shall be decided. Um, and this is in stark contrast to the waiting room of history, as the base Chakrabarti called it. This is in stark contrast to the waiting room of history where colonial subjects were placed, in which colonial subjects were destined to endlessly shuffle um, you know, behind Europe, as it were, uh, always waiting to be handed uh, you know, greater autonomy, some independence, more rights, and so on. Uh, but, this, uh, the, but, this, but this grand narrative, this political project, uh, offered colonial subjects that, that perhaps relative equality that colonial discourse never really could. I mean, this was a story that could be, they could be a part of. Uh, this was a history they could make, and they were a part of that history. Um, and so, as colonial subjects, they were never really uh, they, they, they weren't they weren't people to be acted upon, which is what colonial discourse was all about, in a sense. Uh, instead, uh, they could be part and parcel of the story. They could be the agents of this history. They could be the subjects. They could be the drivers of this history. And so, that is you know perhaps the most compelling and the most seductive power uh, that ideology gave, and that this grand narrative, that this theological idea of, 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 of communist victory, um, you know, gave uh, to these uh, individuals. Um, and so I take that seductive appeal of, of, of ideology and grand narrative uh, seriously as well. So yes, I mean, they may have um, dented some of these dreams that you speak of, and there's a very, interesting kind of like paradoxical relationship over here that yes, I mean, they do kind of like discipline um, these dreams as you put it, uh, but they also fuel them. Uh, they also give them their driving force, their driving power. Um, and so that uh, perhaps is a more, um, perhaps of a complicated way of answering what would otherwise be an excellent simple question. Uh, so ideology in that sense uh, cuts both ways. Uh, it both perhaps weighs down, but it also drives and fuels uh, imagination and, and, and movement and, 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 and politics. Um, yeah, I, I mean, in the book, ideologies usually uh, are expressed through 
in either in nationalistic perspectives or through institutional perspectives where an author sort of pursues to understand and summarize what is actually going on on an institutional level or when it comes to colonialism on a nationalistic level. But you sort of seem to absolve yourself of those burdens and you say that, no, I'm not going to tell a story that begins with institutions. I am not going to limit this to simply a piece of land. I am going to actually talk about these individuals who were found in the archives and who have lived real lives and, and who have had uh, inexplicable experiences. And then I am also through them going to try to explain this internationalism of sorts, um, whether that is a sincere effort to uh, of these individuals to attain an international uh, revolution or whether it's still just anti-imperialist, but they do operate on and they travel a lot. Um, they do operate on an international level, and so and so. I think um, I think we we could move on to the part of the conversation where you tell us a bit about these individuals, where where you tell us um, your favorite ones, maybe, or uh, the ones where you have thoughts are uh, because I mean, all of them. Noor and I were talking, and all of them have such unbelievable uh, experiences. And uh, so, if you could talk a bit about those individuals and why you took on this perspective as you said it it reads like a novel um and a very and a very good one uh, just by the way um and so so why why this focus on individuals uh, why start from there gosh uh, i mean i guess i can start with the word that you used uh, and that was unbelievable um i shared that sentiment as well uh, kumel and and i guess i share that sentiment because yeah i mean it seems extraordinary but at the same time what is equally extraordinary is how ordinary these stories were um, and i cannot begin to tell you um, just how eye-opening it was for me to actually uh, to, to to realize i mean just how again ordinary these extraordinary journeys were and this gives us a sense of the time that these individuals inhabited in which it, were, it was perfectly possible for a for a for, for for an individual born in a dirt poor village in the Potohar, uh, you know, plateau region of Pakistan today, um, to eventually end up in Moscow um, as a representative of India, um, and 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 he is one of the most uh, well, I suppose he's one of the individuals that I'm most drawn to uh, for a variety of reasons. But uh, to to <laughs> To summarize the story, it's an impossible task to summarize his, his incredible story. Um, he's someone, <clears throat> his name is Amir Hadarfan. And so he became known as Dada Amir Hadarfan. Uh, so Dada, you know, is born in the year 1900 uh, in what is now called the Porto Heart Plateau region. Uh, it's a village uh, near Pindi, Darpur village, as I said. Uh, he runs away from uh, home um, at the age of 13 and 14 because he doesn't really like his stepfather too much. His stepfather is abusive. Um, he lands up in Bombay of all places, uh, travels obviously without a ticket. Um, you know, in Bombay, uh, he lands up a job uh, working as, uh, as, as, as part of this industrial workforce that, that serves on merchant ships. Uh, he's in Basra in 1914. He travels the world in, you know, again as an industrial labor force. Uh, they were called Lashkars at the time. Uh, he travels the world twice, thrice across, you know, over the next four or five years. Eventually, jumps ship in 1919 in New York. Um, again, you know, just like uh, wanders across the U.S. Um, doing all sorts of things. Uh, eventually, lands up in Detroit, where he works in. Uh, in, in an auto factory. Um, and there he joins the CPUSA, the Communist Party of the United States. Um, and he's soon enough sent to Moscow alongside other uh, CPUSA uh, cadres and, and, and other party comrades, where he spends uh, three, four years uh, learning politics, uh, uh, learning, uh, you know, uh, being educated, yeah. learning military training. And these Amazing institutions. Uh, the institution that he ends up uh, at is, is, is a world-renowned one at the time. It's called the Communist University of the Torres of the East. It's an institution that harbors and that hosts uh, activists and revolutionaries from across the colonized world. Uh, 
um, where they're giving training and so on. And uh, to cut a long story short, uh, he eventually makes his way back to India, where he spends much of the 1930s, and he's arrested in Madras, of all places, where he runs a study circle. I mean, imagine, like, you know, uh, again, a Potohari, a uh, Russian-speaking Potohari, um, who is operating a study circle in a communist group in Madras. Uh, so, such are the times. Um, and he's arrested, um, and his life after independence, uh, he spends most of his life then uh, thereafter in jail, in one jail or, or another jail, and part of the irony of independence is that he again lands up in jail. Um, uh, so I won't like end his story, but, I would, uh, here, but, I would, uh, but what I will say is that what the focus to uh, directly address your question is that what the focus on individuals allows me to do, what it allowed me to do, is that it allowed me to think about how communism and this political project was part of the everyday. Um, you know, far too often we think of communism um, we write off communism. So that certainly has been the way of much of the scholarship that's produced on it, um, as basically a conglomeration of like fancy founding, like political treatises of one thesis after another. There's this grand story that is led by uh, those great men who sat on top of the party hierarchy. Um, we don't really focus on the ordinary men and women who animated the story, who made the story possible. And so uh, what that focus on individual lives and biographies allowed me to do was that it allowed me to see how communism became part of the everyday, simply put. How communism was not merely a foreign import as it was called at the time. Um, and oftentimes we make this, uh, again, that's, that's, how, that's how ideas are also delegitimized. When ideas are reduced to questions of national belonging and to questions of origin, that's the surest way to delegitimize any idea. One can see that in our context when it comes to, for example, the feminist movement in Pakistan, where feminism as an idea is held to be foreign. Uh, it doesn't seem to belong to land as such. Uh, the same one can say about when it comes to demands of land reforms. Again, that seems that they, they are claimed to be foreign. They don't. They claim that they don't belong to this land, to, 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 to this landscape. Uh, but uh, what these lives remind us of with these ideas that are otherwise portrayed. Um, by uh, nationalist storytelling, uh, that these ideas uh, were part of the everyday, they became part of everyday language, they became part of social institutions, they became part of cultural practices, they became part of poetic metaphors. Um, and so uh, communism then seems to be a part then of this landscape as well, alongside other ideas. Uh, that's the first one. The other, uh, the other uh, point, uh, you know, to go back, back to part of the question is that why depart from starting from institutions and why depart from starting from political formations like the nation state is that once one starts from the vantage point of the nation state, this politics is essentially reduced to the services that it rendered or not in service of the nation state. And so those other possibilities, uh, those other imaginations, those other connections uh, are missed out. And, one, and, 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 and the most important thing that is missed out here is how nationalism was conceived in, in dramatically different ways uh, in the interwar period. So for example, uh, there was no distinction that was made by these figures between nationalism, by which I simply mean uh, the national liberation of a people against their colonial occupiers. There was no distinction between that and the wider project of internationalism, which was to say that all colonial struggle were ultimately, at the end of the day, linked together. And so that question of struggling independently of other colonial uh, struggles uh, never really arose. And if, if empire had to be defeated, it had to be defeated in a global way, not simply in one context or that context. It had to be defeated in a global way. And so this is where the question of internationalism uh, became prominent. Uh, and this is where there was little or no distinction between what was understood to be nationalism and internationalism. And I think that story is then missed out once, when one, uh, once one starts from the vantage point of the nation state, uh, because then, as I said, it reduces all of these struggles and all of these uh, incredible stories uh, to the services that they may have performed in, in service of that national liberation alone. Um, so, uh, this is why I chose to focus on lives uh, instead of these grand narratives that start from uh, the question that, that take the nation state as, as a starting point.
and that take the nation as a, mesh, uh, as a starting point. Uh, so that's what these biographies in some ways allowed me to do. Okay, so um, I'm sort of jumping to a completely new topic, but um, okay. we also wanted to talk to you about the role of women. And mm -hmm. um, it seems that it was difficult to n narrate their stories because they're not found in the archives very easily. So what was that process like when you're searching for a story which would ultimately complete the book you're writing and to not find them anywhere? Um, what what was that like? What was it like just not, was it frustrating in some way? Do you think that these stories exist but just haven't been found yet? Um, what is what is your take on that? I think that's a very important question. Thank you for um, flagging this.